Alabama, number one team in the country, goes on the road to Nashville and show what might be the biggest upset in the last maybe decade. And I mean that when I say it, maybe the biggest upset in quite some time. Vanderbilt knocks off number one Alabama. Your thoughts on the game? Yeah, I know that a lot of people sometimes don't love it when you come on these shows and it's let's point the finger, but the finger does have to be pointed in this situation. Goes on the hands of Kalen DeBoer and Kane Womack, the defensive coordinator. Mm. They, as much as we, you know, we heard about the rat traps, we heard all about that coming into the week. They were not mentally prepared for this game. They took Vanderbilt way too lightly. They could not have been more blatantly apparent. And it translated to such a clear impact in the way that they played defense. Diego Pavia, very elusive, very hard to tackle. He is also, you know, they were using him in a lot of speed option plays, a lot of read option plays. They were utilizing him as a very impactful runner in their offense. And they were not playing good contain. They were not tackling. They were not rallying to the football. The complete opposite of the way that we saw them play against Georgia, the way that we know that they can play. Despite all this, though, and I think this is where we're probably going to start arguing, I'm not out on Alabama yet. No, I'm like, not I, 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 Okay. I think that anybody who is, one, quick to completely crap all over Kalen DeBoer and say that he's doomed is overly reactionary. I think it is way too soon to make that judgment for a guy in his first year at his current job. It is the simple instance of him looking past an opponent not playing up to the standard, and them getting their asses beat. There is so much room for improvement. I know that sounds like I'm being overly positive, Blake, but a little bit. bailing now is way too soon. Well, I will say this. The Malachi Moore thing would frustrate me if I'm yes. a fan. Yes. And everybody knows what's probably happened, how he reacted at the end of the game. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. I know a lot of people already have. It's It's uncalled for. He shouldn't have done it basically told his coaches to go off themselves at the end of the game. Well, maybe, you know, that, that there's a time and place for it. But, Joe, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of get on Kalen DeBoer. Like, we're, we're looking at the players and the aspect of what they did. Kalen DeBoer called a really bad football game as a head yes. coach. Now, offensively, yes. I thought they were fine. They did okay. They weren't great, but they did okay. Vanderbilt had the football for 42 minutes and eight seconds in time of possession. They were 12 of 18 on third downs, Joe. So when I look at this game, what happened? Kalen DeBoer did not try to get his defense off the field. And that's what happens when most co head coaches who are offensive-minded think about one side of the football instead of being a CEO of an entire program. Look, I thought that <laughs> There were multiple times that Alabama could have won this football game, multiple third-down situations where they would do a zone read, guy in the flat, Pavia would, uh, would give it, pull it, run it, throw it in the flat, and it kept beating them. They were undisciplined. That falls on the coaching staff. That falls on the players. But the simple nature that they weren't trying to win, at least establish the running game and give their defense a, a break, who ran 75 plays last, last night, Joe, it is kind of on DeBoer. Now, you can blame the kids. You can blame everybody else. And you're right. People want to point the finger. Yeah. But the simple nature of this game is, is I don't want to look past the – like, like, oh, well, Alabama was just looking, pa looking past Vandy. That's fine. That's an easy way to look at it. No, Clark Lee and Vandy came in there and whipped their ass. Okay. Joe, they, yeah. they got yeah. their asses whipped on the line of scrimmage. They were undisciplined in their front seven. Their DBs – who we thought were really good last week, got pushed around by Eli Stowers, okay? Like, absolutely pushed around. Joe, multiple times, they were just running plays, and he was body-bagging DBs. They wanted it more. And the the what we had grown to know under Saban is that this team never gets bullied. Well, the simple nature is, and the simple fact is, Bama got bullied by Vandy. Now, you can be concerned about it. I'm not out on them, on them either. But they got out-coached, they got out-schemed, they got out-played, and they got out-efforted. And that was why Vandy kept doing it. Now, Joe, here's the big thing for me. Womack is a guy who's still a young D.C. But how uh, the simple nature that 
They, Vandy was 12 of 18 on third down. Joe, they ran the ball 40 times between Pavi and Alexander. It's not like they were busting big runs. They were legitimately three yards in a cloud of dust, three yards, three yards, first down, three yards, three yards, first down, three yards, three yards, first down. That was their game plan. And Diago Pavia, who is just the outright vibe right now, put this team on his back for them to win it. So uh, to quickly to the point that you made about Vanderbilt, yes, they absolutely deserve a ton of credit. And I think that's always going to be something that we quickly, just naturally in the media, we quickly skip over to talk about the bigger program. Clark Lee got his guys ready, and Diego Pavia has been one of the just truest underdog stories that has outworked any um, every single hurdle that's been placed in front of him being a recruit coming out of the state of New Mexico. And for him to land here to get one of the biggest upsets in the history of the sport, in the history of the SEC, it, it's extremely commendable. You're, you're very right by saying this, that Clark Lee, his team, they wanted it more. They were far more motivated. They, they were extremely passionate, and they were going to lay everything out there on the field. To move forward with what you brought up with Womack, that's what's really crazy here is that they didn't do anything that was super unique or hard to stop or anything that was confusing. Their longest rush the entire game was 13 yards. Mm -hmm. Alabama, if we're just talking about like... By the way, playing... Joe, the second longest run came on at the last play of the game where they ran yes. for 12 yards. Right. Yes. Everything that they did was nothing that was so complex to figure out they ran a lot of speed option like a lot pavia was really hard for them to track down and i know he only ran for 56 yards on on 20 carries that doesn't look like a great number but he was able to create so much for his teammates why they weren't playing one better contain and then two trying to pressure him because more. they were undisciplined and they, well, didn't they know were, was right so they were undisciplined but it also felt like why why did it feel like Womack was on his heels the whole game, man? Like, why was there no desire to attack? Why was there no desire like, hey, we're going to start sending right, pressure? Well, let me defend him. Can I defend okay. him? I, I put that more on Kalen DeBoer. Can I tell you why? You legitimately knew in the first half that you had got, like, absolutely abused in time of possession. By the third quarter, okay. you had to have known. Okay. I mean, Joe, again, 42 minutes of time of possession. I'm not trying to take anything away that defense gave up 40 points. But, Joe, think about this. Look at the other side of the football and the running attack by Jam Miller and Justice Haynes. You had legitimate success running the football yourself, and you didn't start playing any kind of keep away. Joe, you're coming all the way back. You're down 30 to 28, and you're throwing the football when you're running it at eight yards a carry. Like, I know that Jalen Milrow is who he is. I know he played a, a – I say a good game, not a great game. But Joe, yeah, the turn running... the, so the turnovers weren't his fault, by the way. For anyone who wants to jump, no, in the, the fumble's in the con... his fault. The fumble fumbles is his fault. Is fumbles his fault. his fault, but his right tackle completely whiffed on a block. So it's it's a mix between the two of them. The interception's a bad no, bounce. No. Yeah. yeah, turnovers. It is what it is. But the bottom mm -hmm. line is, you're still running the football at will. Joe, you... I mean, like they they had yeah. 75 plays at Vanderbilt and had 42. Joe, if I would have told you, if I would have told you on Thursday that Vandy would have the ball for 40-plus minutes in the game. What would you have said? I would have said that they outran them. Bet Online remains your top spot for all of your live betting action and contests. NFL, college football, UFC, NHL are all in full swing. Bet Online is your number one source for wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions with both desktop and mobile access at any time. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code Believe. That's B L E A V for fifty percent off your first deposit. That is a fifty percent welcome bonus. Bet Online, where the game starts. Well, you probably would have said that Alabama's scoring at will and they're right. very explosive, and that Ryan Williams is going off, and that didn't happen. By the way, Ryan Williams got two touches in the second half. Both of them went to, for touchdowns, by the way. Mm -hmm. So not only not getting your best playmaker the ball in space, but you got like you are running the ball down their throat and you're not doing anything about it. I, I think that there comes a part where I I understand what you're saying about Womack, but there's got to come a time for when you're Kalen DeBoer and your defense is completely gassed that you take the you take your foot off the gas a little in this sense. You're already running the football for eight yards of carry. Give them a breather. 
this was an issue that if we recall last year with with Kalen DeBoer, there were times where they abandoned the run game so much so that it felt like if you just were checking the box AKA scores the for National Washington, Champion. if yeah. you were just right, if you were just checking the box scores for Washington, you would have thought that they were they had a, a trouble running the ball, like that they couldn't figure out how to run the football. That whatever you might have guessed that that was an issue for them, but towards the end of the season, when they leaned on their run game, that was when Washington was at their best. This is just a general concept that frustrates the shit out of me. And the people that are in the analytics community that love to to yell about, well, running the football is not very efficient. You're just better off throwing it, blah, blah, blah. Those people don't know shit about the sport of football that make that argument because this is the perfect example. When you start abandoning running the football and you're overly committed to passing and you're not leaning on what can work when you know that it can, you are going to sell your team out. You're going to sell your offense out. That decision-making that you're talking about is so very true. And it applies for what we're going to talk about with Missouri later. It applied for what we talked about with Old Miss later. Balanced offensive attacks are the key to success. You need to lean on your run game when it's working. It is the way that teams win football games. Teams that can run the ball, especially in college football, win freaking football games. I completely agree with you. The The, the fact that like I'm looking at a box score here, Jam Miller and Justice Haynes, five carries, six carries, is it, 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 it's, in, it's insane. That well, was the amount of carries. for Jam Miller, who's at nine yards a carry, right, yeah. and two touchdowns. I, I mean, there comes a part where you got to take – you, you can't take your gas, like your foot off the gas, and then when the game got late, you didn't have a choice because you were down. Like, I look when when uh, Vandy was up 33-28, to 28, Joe, as an example, and the, the turnover just occurred. There was a third and four in the red – or third and one in the red zone. They ran a triple option RPO where they did a zone read, and Pavia could either give it, run it, or throw it in the flat. Well, he pulls it and throws it in the flat, and it's a touchdown. And, and I know you can tell that Womack – who is talking to all four or all three of the safeties that are on the field at the current moment? He is literally telling them what's coming, and they, and they still don't like execute what they need to execute. There was always going to be at some point in this season for Bama because the the, the big man Saban left that they were going to have a game like this. I just don't think that anybody figured that it would be Vandy that happened. Joe, I, I got to be real with you. If you, uh, it's not a traditional triple option team, but they didn't do anything special. There was no. nothing special from a dynamic X's and O's standpoint that they did. They knew that you had better athletes than you, or that you had better athletes than them, and they out schemed you. But I gotta, I gotta say this, Joe. I got, I, like, I gotta say it. That D line got pushed around, and I understand that they, there wasn't necessarily instances where there were long runs, and it was, the longest was thirteen. When crunch time happened, when crunch time was here, what happened? Vandy ran the ball at will. And I think that that in and of itself, when you look at it, you're like, by the way, Pavia would have had over 80 yards rushing if the sack yardage wasn't included into it. So I, I'm like, I, 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 you got to take all of that into account. Yeah. But they couldn't stop Diego Pavia, who, Joe, I, I, I'm going to be, I'm just going to say it. I, I don't know how else to say it. He keeps them a contender in every game that they'll play for the rest of the season. They have Kentucky well, this weekend. Well, and when you say contender, you're just saying that he, he it keeps them alive, not like – yeah, Bad work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gives them a, the ability to win in any game that they play from here on out because that dude is just a playmaker. They are, and it's what we said in the preview, he is a headache. He is the type of no quarterback doubt. that is extremely elusive, is experienced – puts everything on the field, leaves it all out there, is not afraid to take chances or take risks. He is a headache for everybody that they play. And I know that there's probably not an expectation that Vanderbilt finishes the year 9-3. and three. It's probably not going to happen. But could they end up being bull eligible, being 6-6, six and six, and knocking off another team in an unexpected upset and beating up on the rest of the back end of the SEC? It's totally capable for them to, to have happen. I'm a fan of Pavia, though. He, he's he's an electric player. He is very fun to watch. He creates for that team. I hope that next year that they're able to find a kid like that again because it, it's, it stinks that his time of, in college is going to be done after the season. Any other thoughts about this game? No. The, what I brought up in the beginning I think still stands true. One, Alabama's playoff hopes are not done. They're not dead. They now can't drop any of their other big games remaining on their schedule, I think but they still they're can. not gone. They can lose another game and make a playoff. 
Yeah, they can go. They can go ten and two and still get in, but like that's the at most, and they've got a couple of uh, difficult matchups. It's probably going to hurt them that Missouri is not going to look as good of a good of a win when they play them. But there's still a shot. The playoff is still alive and well. The SEC championship is still alive and well. Yeah, I, I mean, look, a team that has a pulse. Okay, and, and, well, let me say this. Let me, I'm, let me let me back up and scratch what I just said. Okay. Here's what I'm also going to say that I think did happen. I think Kirby figured out the board in the second half and teams started implementing it outside of Ryan Williams catching that long bomb that saved them. I think, look, there were there were a lot of things defensively that Vandy did to slow them down. Lots of things. Joe, they didn't really, outside of Ryan Williams, they weren't doing anything. They were going man-to-man on everybody else, brother. I, I mean, they were doing run-free high that shaded to Ryan Williams. That's why he wasn't as effective. Now, you got to still find ways to get him the football like you did on the reverse and the touchdown. But I'm I, I'm I'm just going to say that I'm really interested that after that Georgia game, you see Clark Lee, who's a defensive-minded guy. You know this better than most. Boy, they ran a lot of the same stuff that Georgia did in that second half, did they not? So I, I'm just going to see – they're going to have to figure out how to beat what they're seeing schematically right now for them to keep going. So, yeah, so they do. Mm-hmm. You know, but you're right. The season's not over for Bama. All right.